Welcome to Travel Baseball Coach Justin Podcast. Travel Baseball Coach Justin interviews travel baseball coaches, tournament directors, and former players from around the nation. Here's Travel Baseball Coach Justin. Two pitches at deep to right. And that baby's gone. Brown pulled down the line and fair. And, uh, Seth Brown and he hits one high and deep to right. Phillips turning around and that baby is gone. This season so far, every team has struggled. Right field and deep. Kepler going back. It's over his head. One. Line drive, base hit right center field. Line drive, left field, base hit. Runner goes and that one's hit high and deep to right. Meadows back and baby's gone hey i'm travel baseball coach justin here and what you saw was a highlight reel of our next guest uh, seth brown with the oakland athletics hi seth how you doing doing good how are you i'm doing well thank you for being on the show um hey seth can you give us a little progression on how you got to the big leagues yeah no absolutely um yeah so 2010 is uh my year i had in medford there uh, i went to north medford uh, high school and um, yeah, so, you know, I, I'd say starting, starting in Medford, um, you know, I didn't really have a lot of direction about what I wanted to do. You know, baseball for me was, was always something I was good at. Um, you know, but I think like most high school kids, you don't really have an idea of what you want. Um, and you don't really have necessarily a backup plan. Um, you know, so for me, I, I wanted to just, I knew I wanted to play baseball and that was about it. And, um, you know, and, and obviously changing schools for my senior year, you know, trying to fit in with a new crowd um, and just a, a, you know, kind of a completely different change as far as socially from going from Climate Falls over to Medford. Um, you know, it's just it was a whirlwind for me um, is the best way to describe it. And, um, you know, and for me, as we kind of entered that season of, of North Medford, um, you know, I started wondering, like, OK the process of going to college as far as baseball is concerned, you know, um, it was one of those things where I wasn't also, I was kind of a late bloomer. So, um, you know, my numbers were good, but it wasn't anything that was going to jump out at the page and be, and be like, wow, you know, this guy is, um, you know, D one athlete or just a collegiate athlete. You know, I was hoping to just try and get in somewhere where I could play, um, you know, and then um, I went to Oregon. Or I call, I got a call from Pat Bailey, who at the time was one of the, one of the assistant coaches for Oregon state, you know, invited me to walk on, um, and, you know, and as a as a high school kid, and and I think I think that's true for most high school kids these days. Um, the only thought in your mind is it's D one or nothing. If you don't go D one, you don't you, you know it's it's not worth it. Um, and, and I think that's just the biggest mis uh, like the biggest misconception we have is as athletes, especially in high school. Um, you know, at the time, all I wanted to do was was play D one, and um, you know now I look back at it and it it was just a. a a mixture of me uh, not understanding what college baseball is in general and, and how to progress and how to get better. Um, you know, and I, and I tell every kid I talk to these days about it, you know, D one, unless you're going to get a chance to play as a freshman, it's not worth it. Um, you know, if you don't have the opportunities to play as a freshman um, or at least an opportunity to earn a starting spot as a freshman, um, it's not worth it to go. Uh, and I tell almost every kid I see these days that asks about it. And um, it's just about getting to a place where you can play. Um, you know, and as long as you're getting everyday playing time, that's how you get better. And it's not about the level you play at. I mean, you look at me, you know, I ended up at an NAI school uh, in Lewiston, Idaho, which is a fantastic program. Um, you know, and there's been a lot of guys that get drafted out of LC and a lot of D1 guys that didn't make it in D1, whether it's grades or, or what have you, whatever their situation is, um, you know, and, but that didn't come later for me, but, um, so when I was leaving North Medford, that was my thought process. And you know, I went up to Oregon state and, you know, mentally, you know, and like I said, I was a late bloomer and both, you know, physically, um, and my maturity level in general. Um, so, you know, going to Oregon state was for me something I was like, okay, you know, they offered me to walk on, you know, I can do that. I, I, I know I can play D one. Um, and you know, the fall there, um, uh, it's just a lot, you know, uh, I'm a small town guy and, you know, when you step into a classroom of 500 people in every one of your classes, um, you know, it, it's a lot. 
Um, and you know, for me, that wasn't a place I was going to, I was going to succeed. And, uh, quickly, you know, the grades started kind of dropping off and, um, really you know, pretty quickly recognized that that, that wasn't going to make it. Um, you know, thankfully, um, one of my best friends, Michael Bradshaw, who also is a North Medford graduate, um, he was going to Lynn Benton Community College, which is right next door to Oregon State, and they have a dual enrollment program. And so I went over there, and I was thinking, you know, and still in my head, um, you know, I was like, man, you know, I shouldn't be here. I should be D1. Um, you know, I'm going to do everything I can do to, to get out of here and go back to D1. And, um, you know, and as I was there, you know, stuff started to really um, stack up as far as, I started to understand the realities of, of the situation. Um, you know, grades, uh, you know, were suffering, you know, ever since going to Oregon state and trying to dual enroll, um, focus was not where it needed to be. Um, as far as baseball goes, as far as grades goes, um, you know, just, um, at that time for me, it was more just, Hey, you know, my thought process was like, I'm pretty good at baseball. Things will all work out. You know, I don't have to, I don't have to necessarily, uh, go over the top, you know, things are just going to line up, you know, that was the, you know, the immaturity of my mindset at the time. And so after that season goes by, you know, I started to realize, Hey, you know, D1, is it going to happen? Um, this is, this is where I'm at. And, you know, of course, you know, I wasn't happy with where I was at. <clears throat> um, you know, I love coach Hawk there. Greg Hawk's a phenomenal human being, the head coach at, or was the head coach at Limbit and community college. And, you know, I love him to death. And, um, you know, after my first year there, I just mentally, I, I just was not there, um, you know, and, and like I said, just stuck in a whirlwind of, of emotions and, um, you know, feeling things not going the way I've always wanted them to go. And, um, you know, so having to step away from that, um, you know, I told the coach there, um, hey, it's time to, you know, I'm going to I'm going to step away here. I need to go try something else just because this, you know, deep down, I felt that, you know, junior college was not ever where I saw myself. And. Uh, ended up taking a year off of school, you know, uh, actually worked at a gravel pit for a while. Um, and just, you know, at that gravel pit I, is kind of what I attribute where I started to to really look at myself at, in a mirror um, and see, you know, my, you know, the things that I may have thought were, you know, using as excuses at the time were just flaws in my personality, flaws in who I was, um, you know. And so I spent a lot of time alone. Uh, at that gravel pit uh, just because I, my job was to weigh the truck. So I was at the, you know, the forefront entrance of the, of the gravel pit trucks would come in, you know, and there, there were busy days, but then there were days where it was like, maybe I see only two or three trucks a day. So uh, just a lot of time to think and a lot of time to um, really kind of look at myself and be like, Hey man, you know, you've, you've put yourself in this situation and now you're, you're kind of, you've kind of done to yourself and there's nowhere to go now ruined, your opportunity at, at Lim Benton, um, you know, you can't play anymore. So in my head, I, you know, I thought, hey, um, baseball is kind of done for me. I'm going to have to figure out something to do. Um, and, you know, it's funny. I look back at it now and meant like when I think about where I was at mentally and the thoughts that were going through my head, I always felt that baseball would always would always work out. I, I just I never felt like I was done done. Um, you know, I've al always had those thoughts in my head like, hey, uh, you know, and I, and the bigger part of me thought I ruined it and thought it was like, Hey, this is it. You're done now. Like going to have to move on with, from the baseball th thought process and get a, a regular job and try and go to community college and get things going a different direction. Um, and about that time I ended up getting a call from, uh, coach Greg Hawk up at Lynn Benton. And he told me, um, he said, Hey Seth, you know, I know, um, things didn't go the way you wanted them to. Um, and you know, you left in a pretty big fashion, you know, and, and, and I really sprung it on him at, after, at the end of the season too, and told him I wasn't coming back. And uh, for him being the man that he is to call me back and, and, and bite not, I mean, not only, you know, not hold that grudge against me, but to, to actually invite me back and say, Hey, I want you to come up and have a better focus and do things right this time. Um, and so I did. And, and uh, so I played well enough my freshman year at uh, Lewis Clark state to get in this, what they call the, the JUCO or the NWAC sophomore showcase, which is, you know, the top sophomores from the year, or the top freshmen from the year before get to go to the showcase before their sophomore years. Um, and he was able to get me into that, even though I had already taken a year off of school. So the one that I qualified for had already gone and passed, but he was able to get me back into the next one. Um, you know, so this is 
oh man, I, you know, I forget the months, but you know, I hadn't really done any baseball related stuff. You know, all I was doing was working at the gravel pit and doing long distance running just because I felt I was full of anger, um, you know, defeated mentally, but you just angry at myself about, you know, where I was going. Um, so I got into long distance running at the time and, um, you know, I'd get up and, uh, go to the gravel pit and right after the gravel pit, I'd go, you know, run and lift and just, you know, run my face off to just feel that. I mean, that was at that time. The only time I really felt good, um, was when I was running. Um, and so for him to call me back, you know, I, and I always attest, you know, I'm forever grateful to that man for, for taking me off that path that I was on and, um, giving me a second chance to play. Um, and so sophomore year, um, you know, that showcase, I ended up doing very well at that showcase. And that was the first time scouts had ever given me questionnaires. Um, you know, and I had, uh, colleges contacting me about, you know, grades and, um, all that stuff. And, you know, that's why when I talk to kids now, you know, I preach grades above all else because, um, you know, where I was at and how I struggled at Oregon state with my classroom had set me back quite a ways. And so I had a lot of D one schools, um, offer me scholarships and, you know, but when you go, like, I, I did not have the grades to go the way it was set up. Um, if I went to a, a, in a D one school, um, I was going to have to redshirt. And, um, you know, for me, it was more, I think the embarrassment of it all. Um, you know, I always, I kept the colleges right there telling them, yeah, you know, I'll send you my transcripts over. Um, but you know, this is the embarrassment of it all. I think, um, you know, it was kind of one of those things. I knew I was never going to go back to a D one. Uh, and I, and I, I had started to recognize in myself that I needed a grind and I needed something with mega structure, something that's going to ask, not just the best of me, uh, physically, but the best, the best of me mentally. And, and so, um, you know, I got very close with coach Hawk at that sophomore year and, and, and my sophomore year went better. Um, but it wasn't, I always felt like I was not scratching the surface of what I felt I could do. Um, and so I, you know, towards the end of the season and the school year trying to make decisions on, on where the best place to go is. And I asked my, you know, coach Hawk, I said, Hey coach, you know, um, what do you think is the best place for me to go? And he said, well, have you heard of LC state? And I said, no. Um, and I said, uh, did, you know, like, cause he was all, he was very close to me on calls. I was getting from scouts calls. I was getting And, and to me, even my sophomore year, um, you know, I had a lot of scouts come out and watch, um, you know, and take BP form and stuff. So, uh, even in my head, all I could think about was the draft, you know, and like hoping I didn't have to go back to college. I could just go play pro ball and, and move on and, um, you know, ended up not getting drafted. And, that, you know, and that was crushing to me at the time, um, just because I started to realize that maybe I wasn't as good as I thought I was. And, um, you know, and that's hard to accept uh, when you are, you know, a, a young college kid. You know, everybody wants confidence and everybody, you know, you're supposed to you, you preach confidence. And um, it, to me, looking at it is like, and accepting the fact that, Hey, you're not as good as you, as you think you are right now. Um, you know, and that didn't deter me of uh, thinking like, Hey, you, you, you can do this and you can become the player you want. Um, at that time, I didn't realize the type, the amount of work it was going to take. Um, and so after all that, you know, um, starting to realize that, Hey coach, you know, where do I need to go? Where's the best place for me? And he, he had recommended LC state and I had never heard about him. And um, you know, he, he, he said that he's, pretty good knows the coach um, actually coached Jeremiah Robbins, who was the coach at LC state at that time. He played at Lynn Benton years ago. Um, and he said, Hey, I know the coach. They weren't even going to call you because they didn't think that you were going to even be, um, you know, consider an NAI. And so I said, coach, you know, I trust you, you know, me. Um, and he said, Seth, it'll be one of the hardest things you've ever done. Um, but if you, if you embrace it and you accept it and he goes, you'll find a whole new part of yourself. Um, and so going up to else, I said, okay, coach, like I trust you, let's do it. Um, so going to NAI, uh, Lewis Clark state in Idaho and show up and, uh, you know, off the bat, recognize the, the, I guess the, the type of program I had, I had fallen into, um, was the program that wasn't going to accept excuses. That wasn't going to accept anything, but your physical best, um, and, your men, your mental best is as well. Um, and I realized it kind of the first day of practice, uh, first day of practice, you know, it's kind of a funny story. You know, some, some of the teammates I have from up there, uh, we, we, that place up there is one of the more, most physically challenging, but, uh, you know, beyond the physical, 
um, you know, is the most is the most mental challenging place I've ever I've ever seen in, uh, or heard of at any other time. Um, it challenges you in a way where, you know, we would run so much to where, you know, I, I, I remember puking every day for a good month. Um, and, and I mean, I'm talking we were running miles and miles and miles every single day. Um, and not just that, I mean, beyond the, 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 Hey, after practice, we're going to condition the whole practice was based around physical conditioning. Um, and his, his, his like lessons on that, or, you know, when you are physically exhausted, um, you know, you, you can go to a place mentally where it doesn't bother you and it's living in that place. And that's how he wanted us to practice. He wanted us to practice in that way of, we are so physically exhausted. You don't think you have any more, um, you know, you've puked you know, however many times, then we're going to, now we're going to practice. Now we're going to get better. You're going to, you're going to play this way. Um, and that took me, you know, a while to, to get used to. And I remember thinking I had made a mistake coming because, um, you know, he, he didn't say a word to me the whole month. Um, and, and it was an incredible, I mean, for me, it was like, man, you know, he, he hates me. Um, you know, the, like, the, the amount of yelling that was done, you know, and yelling has never bothered me, you know, getting yelled at on a baseball field is something that I've always been around. So, you know, it wasn't his yelling, but it was the fact that he never said a word to me, never said anything. It was you alone, you alone are going to do this, or you're going to get yourself out of it. One of the two, um, you know, and it took me about a month. And, you know, that was when I really started to see um, where I wanted to be was, was down this road. It was going to be the hardest thing I've ever done, uh, but it was where I – it's something – it's the person I've always wanted to be, and it's the the baseball player I've always wanted to be. And I started to see results from it, and not just on the field, but in classroom. Um, you know, I started taking the same approach that he would have us play the game at in the classroom. Uh, my grades started to, to, to rise. I mean, everything was just becoming better. Um, and I realized about a month in that that was – this is the, the path to where I want to go. Um, it's not for everybody and it's not, you know, I, I don't recommend it for everybody because it's, it's the, it's one of the hardest things you'll ever do. And some guys, you know, some players and some people don't need that. I was a person that needed a place where there were no such thing as excuses. You either did it, you either failed or you'd succeeded. There was no in between, um, except nothing but your best at all times. And you're going to go until you think you can't go anymore. And then we're going to, then we're going to go some more, um, you know, and, so, but all the way through fall ball, you know, I started to do extra stuff. You know, this is when I was already, you know, had run previously in my past. So, you know, physically I'd never faced anything like what he put us through. I mean, I've always done conditioning. You do a conditioning all growing up. Uh, but what they do up there is, is something altogether different. Um, it, it's the close, I, you know, I talk about it with a lot of guys and, and I will say, it's the closest to being in a military uniform you'll ever get to is wearing that LC state baseball uh, shirt on your chest. And um, so as we go, you know, my grades are coming up, but the hole I put myself in, um, you know, at Lim Benton and, and Oregon state was still, was still kind of trailing me. And uh, you know, so even at this time, I'm feeling great. You know, I'm feeling good. Um, I'm getting up every morning and not only am I, I'm, I'm getting up at five in the morning to run my own five miles. I'm doing all the conditioning on top uh, of my grades have never been this, this well, you know, this good. And, and I've never hit the ball like this. Things are looking up and, you know, when it's all said and done, you know, because I had put myself so far behind coaches pulled me in the office and said, Hey, you're going to have to red shirt this year to catch up. And, you know, just another blow for me mentally, I think um, it was, it was like, man, I had, I had been putting in this work for five months now, finally, I mean, grinding it out every single day, pushing myself to the physical limits that I, I mean, past the physical limits that I ever thought I had. I mean, and I was like mentally so strong, like physically and mentally strong. It was, I mean, there was nothing I, that they, that coach could do to me anymore as far as physically or mentally that was going to break me down. I mean, I was such a, in such a good place. Um, and to hear him say, you know, Hey, we're going to have to redshirt you now to catch up. Um, it's just another blow. Um, and, and you know, there's, it, it, that's why baseball to me is, is like life. Um, you know, not just from the playing aspect, for, but when you make mistakes early, you will pay for them at some point and you never know when that is. Um, 
but you got to be, you know, it's, it's, it's like taxes. They're always going to come due, um, you know, at some point in your life. And this was my point of like, well, I mean, this is where I want to be and this is what I got to do. So, uh, you know, got to have to swallow it and catch up. And so I spent that whole year, you know, uh, practicing with the team every day, even though, I mean, and he would, you know, even though red shirts technically don't have to practice at certain, you know, they don't have to go to certain things. I went to everything possible. Um, that was hard, you know, and is, you know, when the team during the season gotten, you know, had a bad, had a bad season, they had 4 a.m. hitting in the cages. I was there joining with the team doing that stuff. Um, just trying to make things hurt physically and hurt mentally as, as much as I could to toughen myself up. Um, and, and to make sure that I was making every day suck so bad um, that I could get through it, no problem, anything else. And so that was my goal for those two years there was I want to see how terrible I can make every single day on myself uh, and still succeed. Um, and don't get me wrong. There's, I mean, there's days you have where it's not, it's not easy, um, you know, by any means. And there's days where you feel broken and battered, but I, I started to realize that the more broken I was physically and mentally and still went out and continued to push myself past any limit that I thought I had, it made me stronger. It made me better. Um, and I started taking that to life. And that's when I started to realize what coach Robbins always said about a warrior way. And, and it's the warrior mentality. And a lot of times it's, you know, we get caught in the baseball mindset of, oh, Warriors just, you know, we're going to go out and beat everybody on the field. Um, but, you know, I, I, Jeremiah Robbins is a genius as far as, you know, baseball and life is concerned for me, especially for guys like me who, who need that, that structure and that organization every single day, day in, day out with no excuses. Um, it, I started to realize that this isn't just a baseball thing. This is a life thing. And when you can take it to your life and, and it's funny, you know, all my teammates that, that went through the same thing I did there, um, you know, talk to me and today, and it's like, man, I just do what we did on the baseball field in my everyday job. And it's easy. Like there's nothing that compares to what we did. And not only that, my job, like I'm, I'm, I'm being promoted. Like I'm, I'm moving through this job, like it's cake and like good things are happening. And it's all because of coach Robbins and, and what he instilled in, you know, the guys that are lucky enough to play for him and play at LC state, uh, you, when you take that mindset, life becomes easy and there's nothing in life that you can't get through when they, when he makes a stressful environment as much as, as much as that is. And, and by stressful, he would, he would pull us up before practice and we condition and you, I mean, we would run so much before practice even started that you're puking before practice even starts. And then he would pull us up after conditioning and he'd say, Hey, you know, now we're going to practice. Now we've got a seven or eight, or nine inning inner squad with a slider machine at 95 miles an hour. And every strikeout we have, you're going to run some more after practice. And every error we have, you're going to run more after practice. Every bad throw, every, if I catch anybody not sprinting on and off the field, we will run more. And you're already puked. So you've already expired. And most people stop before they – most people, when they're in that sort of a physical challenge, they will stop before they throw up anyway. So you've already got to that point. Now you got nine innings of that. And he would start us in a 2-1 count, a 1-1 count, and the bases are loaded, and you're running nonstop. So you're puking three or four more times throughout an entire practice. And that's if you didn't – and that's if you didn't even have a strikeout, anything else happen, because then after practice, you're doing more. Um, so when you get to that place, and that's literally every day out there. I mean, it's not just a once-a-week thing. That's every what, single what, day. Yeah. Um, this was a dirt and grass yeah. baseball field. It wasn't a turf field. <laughs> no it was a, yeah it was a grass field oh good and, okay and you, funny you can wash that stuff yeah. into the ground okay right. yeah and it, it it got to a point with me where i didn't feel like i got any better during a practice unless i wasn't bleeding or hurting and that's how i that was my mindset and you know it, people a lot of people say oh hey that's psychopath you know like you're crazy man but like i got obsessed with the idea of of putting myself through miserable things yeah. so that anything else I came across and was going to be good. And yeah. I think a part of me honestly was punishing myself too, for the mistakes that I had made in my past anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, but at the same time, all that stuff was making me better um, and getting me to the place I wanted to be. So it was kind of a, a kill two birds with one stone. Like, you know, I took every mindset, like uh, when we got into stuff like that was tough, 
at the beginning, my mindset was, hey, you deserve this and you got to do it now. And it got to the end where I wanted it. And I felt like I had, I want it harder, you know, and I would tell, and, and I would pull up the team in the middle of conditioning. Everybody's, you know, like I said, people were cramping up, people were throwing up. It's, I mean, and I'd say, hey, man, there's nothing he's going to do to break us. We can do like this. This is easy. Like we'll keep doing this all day. We don't. And I, and I got, and I was just that way. Um, and then, uh, so that goes on for, um, you know, a year, year and a half. Um, and so we've hit season now at LC state, you know, my, I'm finally playing and I'm playing well, my grades are right. Everything's going well. Um, you know, and I think the biggest lesson in that season for me, um, was I had given up on pro baseball at this point. Um, after I hit, when that, when that news of the red shirt came to me, um, that I was going to have to red shirt, I figured, Hey, that does it, man. Like, this is you did like you've put yourself here. Now it's up to you to make the best of it. Um, and, and I say, and I say, I think I became a man at that time because I was looking at it and understanding that and embracing the fact that I had, I had done that. I had put myself in that situation. Um, and pro ball to me became something that, yeah, it'll always be my dream and it always would be, but, mentally i was in a place where i was like well you you've 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 ruined that for yourself so you can let that go and you can make the best of what you have now right. um and so after that red shirt year it became let's focus on getting a degree let's focus on playing the best baseball you can play and winning a national championship um and being the best teammate i could be um excuse me and so mid-season i'm playing well and it, to me Pro baseball to me um, at that time was, was not even in my brain. Um, it was gone. I was, I was, I had, I had let go of it. I had moved on when, and get to get my criminal justice degree um, and to play the best baseball I could play and be the best teammate I could play there and win a national championship. That was all that mattered to me. Um, and so as we get through that season, you know, um, you know, I'm getting scouts stuff sent to me um, and I'm filling it out. But by that time I had done it before. Um, and nothing happened. And I knew at the time, you know, and I talked to scouts and, uh, and I knew at the time it's like, Hey man, you know, uh, scouts, you know, they're going to, they're going to talk to you. They're going to tell you things. Um, but until you've signed a, a contract with somebody, it doesn't matter what they say. And so I filled them out. But to me, I was like, I don't really care about this anymore. Like, yeah, I, I like, this is good. This is gone. You know, like get it out of your brain because you've been down that road. You had a chance. It's gone. Now you're here. Um, and so, playing well, playing well. And, um, you know, good things are happening. We get to the national championship and, you know, we win the national championship. And, um, that moment for me, um, was the, the most, I, I think still to this day, there's really nothing. I, I haven't had that feeling since, um, the closest thing that comes to is getting called up in to the, you know, to the, uh, big leagues, but that moment, it was finally, I had, I had put together two years of, nothing but hard work. Um, and I think it was the first time that I had made a long-term goal for myself, uh, and accomplished something. Um, it was, I had broken my body to the point where everything on me was calloused. I had pushed myself in the classroom, finally saw results in the classroom and to have all of that, um, uh, the emotions of it all, uh, were, were incredible. Um, and so after that, you know, uh, to me at this time, I had put on the best, best and like my numbers in baseball, they had never been this, this good. And, you know, hitting 24 homers and um, it, to me, I, I was like, well, you know, coach was talking to me about the draft and I didn't care to me. I still had another year of eligibility. The only thing on my mind was coming back and doing this again. Um, I didn't care about pro baseball really anymore. Um and, you know, and coach would tell me, hey, you know, Seth, if you get drafted this year, you should go. You know, you're already older now because you took a year off and you redshirted. If you want to play pro ball and you get a chance, you should go. And I said, OK, coach, like at this time, you know, Coach Robbins had become, um, you know, a role model for me. And I had become very close with him by that time um, in those two years. And so I said, OK, coach, well, you know, I'm going to go play some summer ball. Um, you know, and if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, I'll be, you know, I can't wait to get back here and do this again. 
And so uh, I go to Bend actually to play for two weeks before the draft. So I'm playing baseball in Bend there with the Elks and, um, you know, waiting on the draft and seeing what's going to happen. And so the draft starts and, you know, I had gotten some calls, um, you know, and in my mind, I was like, well, hopefully I can be, you know, I knew I wasn't going to get a call on the first day. Um, but to me, I was like, man, you know, I think I played really well. Like if I'm going to go, it, you know, I, maybe I'll get a chance in the top 10 rounds, you know? And so me in my mind, obviously I, I was playing this summer and, and now it was like, now that I've gotten the okay from my coach that this is something I should do. I allowed, you know, pro ball to kind of get another, uh, you know, a, another foothold in my mind. And so I was like, okay, well, um, it's got, you know, I, I know I'm going to go in the top 12 rounds was my thought. You know, I was like, I, I played well enough. Uh, my numbers are there. The age is going to hurt me. But uh, from all the scouts I had talked to, I was like, yeah, I'm looking, you know, worst case, probably 12th round. Um, and then so I start getting calls at about the 10th round. And, you know, I got calls from the Nationals. Um, I think so there was some other team, but I got a call. The Nationals guy said, Hey, you ready to go? And I said, yep, I'm ready to go. You know, what's your number? Told him my number, um, you know, it was for, you know, what I wanted in a, dra- a signing bonus. And um, I said, okay, yeah, I'm ready to go. Just give me the call. And he's like, okay, well be ready here. It's going to be in the next couple rounds. And I said, great. So I'm getting excited, you know, uh, you know, the Washington Nationals, you know, whatever. Um, and nothing happens. Don't even get a call back. So 15th round hits around. And I said, you know what? I'm done with this. This is, I, you know, this is not, this wasn't my, you know, this is my dream, but it's not going to happen. I've already crossed this bridge. It's done. Let it go. So I turned, I, I, I quit listening to it. Uh, didn't, didn't care about it more. Turned my mind back to, okay, I, I can't wait to go to back to LC and, and do this all over again. Uh, and ended up being, uh, you know, I got a call on the 16th round, which I said, didn't, didn't, uh, didn't have my phone on, ended up getting a call from my scout, Jim Kaufman. He said, Hey, Seth, are you, you know, do you have another year of college eligibility? I said, yeah. And he said, okay, well, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to make a call in here. Hold on. You know? And I said, okay, you know, nice. Just, not yeah, Great. Sounds great. Type of thing. And I didn't expect to hear back anything. Right. And then in 19th round, I got a call from, uh, you know, or I, uh, my brother had it up on the computer and Danny and he goes, Hey dude, you got drafted by the Y or by the Oakland athletics. And I said, Oh man, no way. Um, you know, and so, that, but like I said, this is the 19th round, uh, you know, so by that time I, you know, I signed for, <laughs> I was like 20 grand, uh, you know, and after taxes, it was whatever. And, um, you know, I called my coach and I said, Hey coach, you know, like, is this something you think I should do, man? Like, you know, this is the 19th round. Like there's, you know, I, I got another year, I had another year of school. Like I can finish up my degree and be done. Like, you know, like and play another year for national championship. And he said, Seth, you need to go. Like, if you want to play pro ball, you need to go. And I said, all right, I'll go. And so, um, ended up going to, going down to Arizona and, um, and this is the part where, you know, when you go to, when you get drafted, you know, and there's different levels. So in high school, everybody's surrounded by the same players. So you don't understand how many actual players are in the world. So, you know, you start every, every level you go up, there's more the, the cream gets thicker and the, you know, and the more athletes come in. So I'm around all these guys who've gone to, you know, Alabama, LSU, uh, North Carolina, Oregon state, you know, there's so many guys that went to all these big schools and I'm a here an NAI guy, but playing at LC state, it put such a chip on my shoulder um, that I was in, in, mentally in such a good place that I didn't care who was in front of me. In my mind, I was running them over. I didn't care. Um, and that helped me because when you get to pro ball, it becomes more about your own work ethic versus a coach yelling at you to make you do it. Um, but I had that all checked out. Um, you know, I was in a place mentally where I would outwork anybody. It didn't matter how long we went. And it became easy because nobody else wants to do half of what I was usually doing. So for me, going out and get extra work, you know, coaches were telling me, hey, we're, we're done for the day. You can't do any more. Um, uh, you know, and that was hard to swallow for me because it's like, well, I want to do more. Like I, I need to make sure I leave no card unturned here. I want to make sure I do everything I possibly can so that if this ends, I get released, whatever I know I've done all I can possibly do. Um, and actually, you know, a lot of the other guys during pro ball at that time used to you get a good laugh out of me doing extra. Um, and I, uh, and my f- phrase is always said, I said, Hey, it's just because you guys are too soft to do what I do you know, you don't be mad at me because I'm doing more than you're willing to do. 
Uh, and that was my attitude. I wasn't there to make friends. I wasn't there for anybody else. Like I was there to, I got drafted. I want to do as, as much as I possibly can. And that helped me throughout the minor leagues because when everybody else started getting tired, I started just getting going. Um, and I had played so much and practiced so much at an exhaustion state that playing tired to me was easy. It was like, it, 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 it only. How's your baseline from what it sounds like? So we're what we're saying? I, I said that's your baseline is playing tired. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I, Robin, I be, you know, um, work ethic and instilling that in you. Yeah, no, playing baseball tired was something that I had learned to excel at, and yeah. and to this day I don't play well if I'm super rested. I it's just part of who I am now. I, which is why I continue to lift hard. Every like the way I lift is if I'm not playing a little bit sore, I don't feel right, um, and that's just because of what. I got used to doing and how I learned to excel. So, and playing tired puts a chip on, a, puts a bigger chip on my shoulder when I play, because now I, t I tell you know, when I'm sitting in there and I'm tired and sore from lifting, I tell myself, watch me still do this because I know everyone else here feels good. I'm sore and watch me still do it. Um, and that helps me just mindset wise when I'm playing. So, um, you know, and all that accumulated and, you know, obviously there were times in minor league baseball where things weren't going well, but because of going to LC state, it never, it never bothered me and broke me. Like it breaks a lot of players um, today and playing in the minor leagues. It's not easy. Um, and especially when things aren't going well, um, you know, there's a, it, when there's a steamroller effect, when you're not playing well and you have to play every day all summer long, the more you have a bad game, you got to forget about it and move on. And that's a tough thing to do. You have another bad game. Now all that's on your mind is the two bad games that you've had. Then you have three. So it's, it, there's no time to adjust and reset. Right. You got to go out there and do it again. So, uh, that, but all that I was prepared for just because of what I went through at LC, you know, we were scrimmaging every single day. We didn't really practice. Our practices, once we got through the fall, our practices were long scrimmages facing both right-handed and left-handed sliders at 95 miles an hour. It wasn't, it wasn't we're doing drills. We didn't do drills. We played. Um, and that's what I think gets brings out the best in you as a player because there's so many things that we try to simulate and teach in baseball that you can't do because it's not game speed. So our practices were long, strenuous, physically exhausting scrimmages. And when something happened in the middle of a scrimmage that you could coach on, he'd stop the practice. We'd talk about it right then and there and continue the practice. Right. Um, but there's no other way to, to simulate game speed stuff. You can't simulate game speed base running. You can't simulate game right. speed ground ball intensities. Like it just doesn't happen. Um, and so that's all that prepared me to eventually make it to the big leagues. And, um, you know, it helps, it helps me in everyday life. It's just something that I still have a hard time sleeping at night. If I feel like I didn't lift or I didn't do something physically exhausting that day. Um, and it's just instilled in me now. And, um, it's just what it's, it's the person going to LC state. I, I always say it, it unlocked the person I always wanted to be and it unlocked the baseball player I am today. And, um, you know, both co coach Greg Hawk and Jeremiah Robbins, I'll be forever grateful for and owe them everything because of the person I was at the time versus the person that I transformed into. Um, they're two different people. So that's, you know, that, you know, that's really the story of, of me from North Medford to the big leagues. And, you know, there's obviously details in and out. We could go on all day, but, sure. you know, I think the biggest challenge that I see in everyday baseball these days with kids and high school kids and um, in comparison to who, where I was is, you know, there's a, there's a mantra in baseball about going D one. Um, and I, I truly, I, you know, and, and, and it's, it sounds bad to say, but I truly discourage kids unless they are going to play and or have the chance to play every day at, an, at a D1, I encourage kids to not go because if you go there, you're going to redshirt if you don't make the team. You're not going to start probably till you're a junior. If you're lucky, you'll start as a sophomore, if you're lucky. Right. But the thing with D1s is they're constantly bringing in the best players in the country. So if you're not one of those best players in the country at that time, there's a chance you don't play until you're a junior and that's two years of non-game reps. Right. So when you 
when I talk to kids now, I don't tell, and I mean, if you're lucky enough and, and talented enough and mentally mature enough to attack a D1 school and have that skill set, you should. That's great. That's phenomenal. But the reality of it is, there's not many D1 players coming out of, of, of Oregon at, at all anymore. Um, that's just the reality of the situation. Um, you know, there were a lot when I was in high school, but that is just not the same anymore. You know, you have a couple kids, um, you know, maybe one, possibly two from Southern Oregon where I was at. Um, now you have maybe a handful coming out of the Portland area. Mm -hmm. um, but the, 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 the skill level is, is not where it used to be, in my opinion, coming up in Southern Oregon. You know, when I was coming up, we had Ian Kendall, Braden Shipley, Matt Maurer, Colin Sowers. You mean James Nigren, all these guys. I mean, we had five pretty much D1 athletes coming out of my graduation, you know, there was a guy from Grants Pass, uh, Brandon Drury, drafted. Okay. You know, there, there were no plan guys that you can compare yourself to, but it's not that way anymore. Um, and so, I mean, understanding that kids need to see college for what it is. And college is, is a place where you, you go to get better. And if you want to see the best results in yourself and the best – you know, baseball player you can be, you have to get to a place where you can play every day. And, um, you know, and I tell that to every kid. I mean, I put on, I mean, I help out uh, with some teams up in central Oregon. And, um, you know, when I talk to those kids and, you know, and I've talked to, you know, our, you know, your guys' team a lot, yeah. and, you know, especially Max and Eli, I tell them, you know, you have to go to a place where you're going to play. If that's not the case, then the way, the amount of money that you're going to pay to go to a D1 university these days, I mean, if you're lucky to go to a D1 in state, if you're out of state tuition at a D1 school, it's going to be off the charts. Right. Um, you know, it's just about getting better. And and for me, um, just getting to a, going to a school that you're going to play every day, that's going to be the best place you can go. Right. Um, you know, and it's hard to get that message across to kids these days. Well, um, but you know, it's a tough baseball is a tough sport. Right. So like this weekend, we're actually going up to UCC where Jeremiah Robbins is now coaching. Um, yeah. Fox Community College. And they have a doubleheader on Sunday. We're going to go up there, watch a game, mm -hmm. take batting practice, and then watch the next game. Mm -hmm. And what, what's crazy is, um, luckily, two years ago when we went up there for a, a little uh, a clinic for our team, we took the whole team up. Mm -hmm. I learned from him that you want to go where you can play your freshman year as many and get as many at bats, many looks on in the defense as you possibly can. Because we're, if you play, you know, JUCO or NAI or whatever level, if you're playing every day, if you're good, you'll move up to the next level if you want to, right? Like, look at you. You were at LC State. You won a national championship. And mm -hmm. you were looking at staying with them and not going D1 at all because you're just like, what I got going on here is what works for me. Yes. You were in a situation where mentally you were coming out of high school and you need to be broken down in the process that you went through in your life mm -hmm. at the, the, um, you know, the gravel pit working there that yep. broke you down, that, that yep. lowered the defenses that you were thrown up in mm -hmm. uh, between reality and your expectation. And then mm -hmm. when you ran into two fabulous coaches between mm -hmm. Hawk and then uh, Robbins at LC state, those guys just, showed you the path and encouraged you especially hawk calling you back you yeah. know, that story yep this is the third time i've heard this story so that's mm -hmm. i'm so glad you told it because th it is just an amazing story of um trials and tribulations and you know you're just pounding life out and here there's guys helping you out and showing you a path and then robbins just says take the draft go you can come back and i don't know did they win the national championship the next year yeah, they won it the next two. Okay, the next two years. Yeah, you could have, you could have been on that team, but instead mm -hmm. he's he's like, dude, your direction is that way. And again, another great you know um, decision from somebody who you know has a vested interest in love in you to tell you what to mm -hmm. do, which was the right thing. Look at your big league, your big league star now. You're a power hitter in the major league baseball. So it's just it's it's what? awesome. So I can't wait. Is there anything you want me to tell him when I'm up there this weekend? <laughs> Hey, tell him, yeah, tell him I said hello and uh, looking forward to next year's clinic. Nice, nice. Um, so I want to change the subject a little bit here. Um, when you first got to the big leagues, uh, what was your favorite stadium after playing 
your, you know, when you went through the big, you know, your first full year? Yeah. So I think the, I mean, when you, well, it doesn't matter what big league stadium you're in. Um, when you step in for the first time, it's, it is a incredible feeling, um, you know, but for me, I, you know, Yankee stadium is, is obviously Yankee stadium. Um, right. I think my favorite one is Colorado. Um, it, it's, I think the fan base in Colorado is, is awesome. They got, they, they got a full seats every time we're there. Um, you know, the, the stadium itself is beautiful. Um, and, and obviously being in Colorado, you know, it, it's beautiful as well. Um, the surrounding areas. So, um, you know, uh, for me, it's, it's Denver, but you know, it's hard to knock Boston and, and Fenway as well. Uh, Fenway is a very close second just because it's, it's Fenway. Uh, history, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but like I said, I'm not a huge people person or a big city person. So um, when I'm in those places, um, you know, what, unless I'm on the field being in, being in the middle of New York um, is not an ideal place for me. Um, so I think that's why I prefer, I mean, my top are probably Boston, um, Denver and Seattle. Gotcha. Um, also your first uh, year there, it could have been the 2019 year or whatever. When you first played and you recognized you were on the same field with whoever it was that you kind of went, wow, I'm on the same field. I'm playing against that guy or with this guy. Mm -hmm. Who, who was it the first time that you realized, oh my gosh, I'm playing against or with this person what player was that? yeah you know for me um uh, it, it was you know whenever you play against mike trout um <laughs> right you know, it's it's mike trout and you know you're you're on the same you're sharing a field with with mike trout uh you know and you're understanding that you know you're also a big leaguer as well um so you're also pretty good but uh, there's certain guys that even though you're playing on the same field with the best in the world and, and you're part of that small population um, there's guys that still make it look easy and still make it look like, Hey, if there was another, another level above the major leagues, you'd get the call up and go. And, and I think, you know, Mike Trout is for me, um, is something that is, he's very incredible to watch. Right. You just go up to him and talk to him. I would. Yeah, no, I do. Oh, oh uh, good. Good. I like to hear that. Uh, uh, he's a big hunter. So I talked to him about hunting as well. And, oh, um, uh, Nice guy. And, you know, I think most most guys in the big leagues are, are you know, great dudes. And you realize that, uh, especially for me, um, you know, you watch a lot of these guys on television and, you know, uh, but when you talk to a guy like Mike Trout or Aaron Judge, you know, you realize that it's, you know, and, and when you become a big leaguer, everybody's just, a, a you know, a regular person. Yeah, you're and, the club. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, it's like, you know, and, and talking to, you know, Aaron judge, you know, when I had my son last year, you know, I'm holding him on at first. And I'm like, Hey man, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, bring this up right now, but you know, I just had a son and I'd love if I send a Jersey over, if you'd sign it for me. And he goes, Hey man, I'd love to do it. Send it over. Uh, uh, and, you know, they're just great dudes. Right. Right. And you do the same for any ball player that asks you that. I mean, Oh yeah. You know, and uh, the, the thing is, is even in the big leagues, um, you recognize greatness. And so a lot of guys, um, you know, you, you send a jersey over and have certain guys sign it, um, you know, guys that you want a jersey from, you know, and everybody's willing to do it. It's one of those things where when a jersey gets sent over to you, they sign it for you, um, you know, and, and send it back over. And you got a signed jersey from, uh, you know, I got one from Miguel Cabrera, who's also a, fanta a fantastic hu human, oh, you know. Man. Oh, man, I love that. I love that. So, hey, you mentioned you have a son. Um, you entered the league, you know, with, without a son, and then you now are in the league with a son. Has anything mm -hmm. changed being a father and playing major league baseball? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I used to live and die with baseball, uh, you know, uh, and it, it's like I said, it's just who I am as a person. But when I felt when I was failing in baseball, it felt like I was failing in life. And, uh, you know, and it's I think everyone who has a job who looks at a, 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 a or has a job that requires your performance when you fail at it. Um, <laughs> it is going to feel like you're failing in life. You know, if I, if you have an everyday job, a nine to five and you're failing at it, uh, it's going to make you feel like, Hey, you know, I'm failing here and, and uh, in life. And so that's baseball took on that mantra with me a little bit. Um, you know, if I wasn't getting a hit every couple, a couple hits a game, it felt like I was failing everybody. It felt like I was failing myself, failing all my coaches, failing, you know, my wife, failing, failing everybody. And um, it's not healthy, obviously, but um, when you have a son, 
Um, and like I did, and, and that mindset helps me because it, it makes me angry and I always play better when I'm angry. Um, and it makes me, it pushes me more. So I've never had a problem with that feeling. Um, and, but when I had a son, it put it all in perspective, you know, baseball is, is, is a, is a job that I have and I feel so fortunate and lucky to have it. Um, and I've, and I've sacrificed a lot for it and I've grinded to, to earn it. And, but at the end of the day, it's such a small part of your life. Um, and you, when you blink, it'll be over. And when you have a, when I had my son, it felt almost like a weight lifted off my, my shoulders. Um, and it became more as like, man, regardless of what happens here uh, with baseball, you know, that's my son. And I got, I, you know, I get to raise him and regardless of how I do at the field, he's not going to know the difference when I come home, he's going to be happy to see me. Um, and so it, it changed, you know, I no longer live and die with baseball, you know, am I going to get angry at my bad games? Absolutely. Am I going to be frustrated with this game? Absolutely. It's, it's a crazy game and it's hard on you mentally. Um, but at the end of the day, I look at it and it's like, man, this is, uh, this is just, it, it's not going to last. You know, this is, it, you know, I've, I've always looked at baseball like a river and it, it's, it's a weird, a weird thing the way I think about it, but you know, river is always going to flow, yep. you know? And if you're lucky enough to get on it and ride it for a while, once you leave, it's still going to be going. So we only have a small time in this, in, in our lives. Um, you know, unless you're, unless you're, you know, uh, a guy like Mike Trout or Bryce Harper, who's going to play 20 some years, whatever. Um, but for most of us, it's a, it's a short time and you, you enjoy it while you have it and you make the most of it. And at the end of the day, you know, that's it. And you can, and it'll be done. But baseball to me is not live or die anymore. Baseball to me is, is a job that I feel lucky to have. And I enjoy every minute of it. And even the times when it's the worst game in the world, when you've punched out four times, I still enjoy it. So, uh, but having a son created that, that, that mindset for me. Oh, that's great. That's great. So, um, okay. For you in particular, which pitcher have you faced as the nastiest stuff? So, uh, you know, pitchers, you know, easy pitchers for a lot of guys can be really difficult mm -hmm. just for whatever reason. So for you yeah. specifically, which pitcher for you was the the hardest to hit? Uh, you know, maybe they have like a knuckle curve or something that. Just yeah. Whatever it is. So I would say for me, probably one of the. One of the worst guys I've faced, I mean, stuff wise, um, Garrett Cole is up there. He's got great stuff. Um you know, glass now with the rays, yeah. um, back when they were still using sticky stuff, his curveball was <laughs> incredible. Um, you know, and then, uh, you know, bummer for the white Sox is just a lefty with a, with a hard angle that throws 97, 98. Um, I think those three guys are, are some of the, like, you know, I, but the thing is, is, you know, I, I see Garrett Cole. Well, I see the ball well, um, against him, his stuff is just nasty. So it's, you know, even if you're seeing it, when you've got some of the best stuff in the world, you're yeah. not going to, you know, it's not, it's hard to be successful against. Um, but bummer is, some, is a guy I just don't see well at all. Um, you know, it's coming across you at 98 and it is, yeah, it, I mean, he's a high effort guy. So he's, he's jumping at you um, and the ball just explodes out of his hand. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, now the big news the last three days or whenever since Wednesday is the mm -hmm. purchase of 49 acres over in Las Vegas. Yeah. Um, now that is, now I guess Oakland said, I read in the New York times that Oakland is going to move and the earliest the season's going to be is 2027. Um, yeah. And so uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, if you want to share or, I mean, yeah, no, it's um, you know, it's one of those. Did you play where... for Las Vegas triple A for a couple weeks or yeah something. yeah i played there in 19 um you know the thing is is that uh it's it's a it's one of those things where the fan base here in oakland um they're right. awesome fans um you know they they bleed the green and gold um and it's it's a shame that uh a deal couldn't be made here um you know and there's a lot of there's a lot of hoops to jump through and it's in, in right. something like this yeah, uh, down here around, but just you know the move like since you played, yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to get, I didn't want to go. No, at all. no. But, uh, what I wanted to get was you played in Vegas. So when, when the A's move over there, 
Um, is it hotter? Is it drier? I mean, yeah, you no, know, it's going to be interesting to see. It all depends on how, I mean, it's obviously hot during the days, uh, especially when you get to midsummer. Uh, when you hit a certain point um, in that league, they don't even allow you to play day games anymore um, just because of the heat. So, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with it. Um, it's obviously going to have to be, I, I would imagine, a dome. Um, Red is a retractable roof, but you know what? Yeah. I even though if they've settled on that, Every, all yeah, it be something. So just to keep it out of the sun, I mean, out, out of that heat every day, yeah. you know. So, uh, but, you know, it, it, it should be cool. You know, I, I'm I'm glad that steps are finally being made because at the end of the day, you know, we do need a new field. Um, right. You know, and it's – Oakland's got a lot of history, but, um, you know, it's time for a new field wherever that is. And if it's in Vegas, like they say it's going to be, then, I mean, it's going to be – I mean, that's still a long ways off, so, you know – 2027 i mean that's 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 four years away so um you know lots can happen it's just you know you never know until it starts actually being done right so uh you had mentioned um your nephews they're on the generals here yes. and like that i met you january of 2020 when you first came on mm -hmm. and uh i got introduced to you i was like holy buckets you know my first basic coach's brother is uh no <laughs> um and so Every time you come to our practices, you make the stories we hear from the kids of talking after you leave mm -hmm. is, is makes Major League Baseball and also college very tangible, especially when we go up to um, UCC with Robbins camps the last two mm -hmm. years. And then this weekend, again, we're going to go back up. Um, you make college and MLB mm -hmm. very tangible for the boys, not just, you know, like a dream because you, you're living mm -hmm. the reality of it being, you know, one of the, you know, 30 ball players and at first base outfield, wherever you're going to be playing this year. Um, and it's just, it's, it's so nice when you come in and, and you go through the hitting and everything and, and training, because uh, I, I tell the boys as a, as a, a hitting coach to do certain things. And then when you tell them, yeah. they listen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, but that's what it takes. I mean, sometimes when you hear it, like, Every, every kid goes through it. You know, you can hear it all your life and it only yeah. happens, you know, only when you get to a certain point where you're like, oh, that's what they were talking about. I got right. you. Right. And so uh, we now have what I call the Seth quadrant which <laughs> is, uh, for a variety in that screen. It's going to be ball high off the tee down yeah. and, um, opposite field. We yeah. Call that the Seth quadrant. So if the boys are pulling off or something like that, I, I tell them. And then for the lefties, it's going to be, you know, same thing, but, you know, left, yeah. uh, left side. And so if you ever hear that while you're there, I say, hey, hit to the Seth Quadrant. That's what that means. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. So, um, but, yeah, it's uh, it's been a pleasure over the last uh, two and a half years uh, with you stopping by and helping out the generals a lot. It's just it's it's just so much fun when we know you're coming. As a matter of fact, Micah was here the last two days, uh, yeah. Thursday with us. He was out in the ball field, you know, and there were some things the boys weren't doing, and he got them mm -hmm. going. And what's really great is that, whether it's you or Micah, they want to perform for you. So as coaches, we see them giving more effort to, because we play year round, you know that, but yeah, a lot yeah. of the people on the, and the podcast verse don't know that we play year round. And mm -hmm. so it can be monotonous for the boys doing the same thing over and over and over again. So oh. they sometimes cheat. I mean, they're 11, 10, you know, years old. And oh. Eli, who's, who's a studs nine. And, yeah. Uh, it's just it's it's really great when we can get um, you and Mike out there and whoever else that has helped us because uh, we really do appreciate that. So, well, of course, you know, and that's the cool thing about baseball is it. I still do it when I talk to guys who have played for ten years. It's a it, the information that you get about the game um, and spreading the knowledge of the game is is something that is very very important. And um, you know, every big leaguer that I know does a great job of it um is spreading the knowledge that you got from somebody else that 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 you know that that person got from somebody else and uh, you're able to to send that down to uh uh you know kids or even other players you know guys that are just getting in the big leagues um, oh, i learned stuff from you too <laughs> absolutely so it's just but being able to pass that knowledge along is, is what grows the game yeah and and that's the connectedness of that baseball brings and it's just for me it's a passion for my son it's a passion and so um it's yeah. it's, it's awesome um i always do a thoughtful question uh in my podcasts um 
Oh, let's see here. You did go, you explained you went through your hardships and everything and yeah. know, mentally and um, attitude adjustments um, or, or paradigm shifts, I guess yeah. what I call it, to be successful. Uh, mm -hmm. Your coach has got you there between Hawk and Robbins. Um, during that whole process, is there something that like, you didn't expect would happen that happened. Um, yeah. You know, I, I say the, the biggest thing, you know, that happened is, um, you know, I always feel that, um, you know, God has a plan for everybody's life. And um, after everything that's gone on in my life, um, you know, meeting my wife at LC state, which is the last place I thought I would go. Um, it's just all connected in a way that is so, you know, undeniably, you know, not of the world that is, um, it, it's just, it blows my mind. And so, uh, I think that is the biggest thing because I met, you know, my wife, who's not only, uh, an incredible worker, uh, you know, like her work ethic is, is Trump's mind tenfold. Um, uh, but she's, you know, shares every, every thought and mindset that I had at the time is something she also shared and also did with her basketball. Um, you know, Brittany has almost every record in, uh, you know, for basketball at that school, uh, for women's basketball. It, it, and so, uh, it's something that I think that I wasn't expecting, um, you know, because where I was at mentally was I just, all I wanted to focus on was me and what I was doing and what I needed to, to do to get to where I wanted to be. Right. Um, and so I think meeting my wife during all this turmoil uh, of where I was at is uh, probably this is something I didn't expect to have happen. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's all I have for you today. Uh, oh. Anything you want to share uh, that kind of ran through your mind? Be like, oh, I'd like to say this. No, you know, I, I appreciate you having me on, man. And, um, you know, if I could share anything, it's it, it's just for kids out there that are, you know, in that situation, whoever listens to it, you know, you know, somebody, um, you know, understand that it, it's life is long. And it, it, the thing I've learned, I think the most and the thing that a saying that goes along in the big leagues here is it's never as bad as you think it is. And regardless of what's going on, um, you know, you just in baseball terms, it's, you know, if you're over, if you're over your last 20 or two for your last 20 or whatever, but you're taking good swings, everyone always says, you know, Hey, it feels a lot, a lot, you know, worse than it actually is, right. you know? And so, um, that's not my got stuck in it, 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 you know, is when it feels horrible, uh, it's never as bad as it actually is, you know? And so I think that's the biggest, you know, one of the things I'd like to, you know, spread is, um, you know, whatever your situation is, it's, it's never as bad as it seems. And, you know, there's always ways you can, you can go and, and get through stuff. And, uh, so, you know, I, you know, like I said, I appreciate you having me on and, um, you know, I hope this hits somebody and, um, you know, somebody can take something away from it. Absolutely. Well, Seth, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Travel Baseball Coach Justin Podcast with Seth Brown from the Oakland Athletics, the power hitter in Major League Baseball. A power hitter is an individual who hits over 20 home runs a season, and he's done that the last two seasons. Thank you, Seth, for being on the show. Really enjoyed it. Now, my next podcast should be coming up in the next week or so, and again, I got many um, individuals lined up. Nobody's committed yet, so I don't know who's next, but please stick around. We will be uh, posting. Thank <laughs> you.